Good afternoon. My name is Gabor Lukacs. I'm the president of Air Passenger Rights, and this is our weekly update on the latest developments on the matters that affect all of us, the refund issues, the court cases, the chargeback issues, everything that we have been discussing throughout this week. I am going to wait for a little bit of a thumbs up from my faithful team. Uh, I hope that they have all already tuned in. And uh, uh, I'm uh, going to just start in about half a minute or a minute. I'm, I am getting here a thumbs up from Dominic, and so it looks promising. Uh, anyone else? Uh, I'm seeing here Maria. Uh, she's also able to hear me. Chris, hello, Chris. And um, I think we can, I think we are now actually good to go. So as always, I have to mention uh, the wonderful support team that I have, which allows all these broadcasts to take place. And that is thanks to Christine, Martin, Dominic, and Terry, who are all uh, volunteering their time, their energies, their efforts for this cause. And I'm very, very grateful for what they're doing. And uh, I'm seeing more hellos, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, and uh, I would like to come back first before we go to the updates, just to the usual topic, and I'm sure I mentioned it many times, but I'm going to mention it again, of social media activism. We need to be heard, we need to draw public attention continuously to our cause, to the fact that airlines are refusing to comply with the law, they are refusing to give you back your money, your refunds, money that is yours, that is owed to you. They are effectively stealing your money. So please keep doing the daily comments to the Prime Minister's live streams. It may look like that you are being ignored, but you are not. They will have to address this sooner or later. If you keep up the pressure, if you continue raising the issue time after time after time, like a broken record, they will have to. So if you have not done so already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please follow our Twitter uh, feed, retweet our tweets, like our tweets. Use your social media presence as a form of activism. The battle is far from being over. And in fact, it is just starting now. Uh, this brings me to uh, the number of developments that we have had over the past week. It was a very jam-packed week. So uh, let me talk first about the voucher statement case that is currently pending before the Federal Court of Appeal. There have been a number of developments there, and I'm going to try to give you the short version of it. The first development was uh, a motion for leave to intervene, for permission to intervene by uh, an airline lobby group, by the National Airline Council of Canada. I'm going to just get my little tablet here in my lap. So uh, this was... Uh, uh, leave to intervene attempt uh, by the uh, Nas National Airline Council for Canada. And uh, what they tried to do is they wanted to, to interfere, to jump into the court proceeding um, that is already underway before the Federal Court of Appeal about the Canadian Transportation Agency's uh, statement on vouchers. So, uh, in terms of the short versions of what they wanted to do, they were seeking leave to intervene in the application and in the motion. Um, and it, they identify that this relates to uh, the what we are asking is the removal of the public statement from the Canadian Transportation Agency's website. What this lobby group was essentially arguing is that uh, they can somehow help the court to decide the matter, uh, and that is why they should be allowed to intervene. Uh, 
they were all putting in lots of irrelevant information about how uh, how uh, badly the COVID-19 affects airlines and going on and on about how they are affected somehow by the outcome. Um, it is particularly interesting that they say that its members are airlines, that they represent airlines and uh, that they have interest in uh, having sound policy in the present circumstances. This is something that is desperately needed and that they are affected by the outcome the same way, allegedly, as if air passenger rights would be affected. Uh, because they are, they are saying that if air passenger right is allowed to uh, make this application, then they who represent airlines will also be able to somehow butt in and, uh, and make arguments to the court. Now, one fundamental flaw that is obvious in their case is that in the case of NACC, the uh, people who are directly affected, namely the airlines, are clearly identifiable, and there are not that many of them. In their affidavit materials, they specifically identified uh, which airlines are involved. And uh, so th that, that type of usual argument that would usually uh, work and, and in the context of consumer advocacy, where uh, you have a diffuse group of people, like with passengers, there are millions of passengers and tens, probably hundreds of thousands of people affected by this situation, all of them cannot go to court. That argument clearly failed uh, because uh, in the case of um, the um, airlines, they are, they are identifiable entities. So that kind of ended, they, they, that really undermined uh, the argument. So what happened next? And I'm, I'm, maybe one should I, thing I should also mention to you is that the airlines were trying uh, to bring this motion ex parte. Ex parte means that they try to get this motion going without us having a chance to object to it. They just wanted to have it uh, out there uh, without us being able to uh, respond to it, being able to say, to object to it. And... Uh, I think that didn't end too well for them because very quickly there was a direction from the court uh, that uh, they have to serve the, the uh, their motion materials on us. And the court also said that uh, we have to, the parties have to uh, summarize their positions on the issue in two pages. And so that's what uh, we did. And here is, uh, we will also, of course, find all those documents online. So uh, we explained uh, in our submissions that uh, what the NACC is trying to do is in inappropriate for a number of reasons. First of all, they are seeking to uh, significantly expand uh, the evidentiary record. Generally, when someone intervenes, they cannot put more evidence before the court. The way courts have been describing it is that they have to uh, uh, take the case as they're finding. They can make more legal arguments, but they cannot add more evidence. So that's one big no-no. Uh, the second one uh, was that although they have been away, aware of um, the uh, timeline set by the court, they were taking their sweet time before actually notifying the court that they want to intervene. And the third point uh, was that, that we raised was that they failed to explain why those airlines are not coming before the court directly. Why are they trying to make a kind of uh, intervention by proxy? If those airlines want to intervene, that would have been something else. But trying to somehow intervene by proxy, it raises some very serious concerns about what on earth the real purpose of this. Um, 
And last point that we raised uh, is that uh, really their submissions were just repeating what the Canadian Transportation Agency already set out in its uh, submission. So uh, from a court's perspective, the court uh, wants uh, to enrich its understanding of the case. The court is looking for different perspectives on the case. If a, an intervener just repeats what the respondent already said, well, that's not no assistance to the court. In that case, the court uh, is not interested in in that type of intervention. Intervention, which intervention in a, in a especially in a federal court of appeal, is not about saying, "Oh, I was there too." It's not about. It's not that kind of show. It really boils down to whether you are going to be able to assist the court with a legal theory, with a legal angle uh, that uh, the other parties have not raised. And that's, uh, that's indeed uh, how things panned out, because a day later, uh, we got an order from uh, Justice Boivain from the uh, Federal Court of Appeal, and Justice Boivain uh, stated that there was a motion for proposed uh, leave to in for intervention. It identifies here the National uh, Airline Council of Canada, that his lordship read the motion, uh, that there was a response to the parties, and then noting that we were given an expedited schedule, and noting that the court is not satisfied that NACC demonstrated that a test for granting leave to intervene is met. As a result, motion for leave to intervene by NACC has been dismissed. So, um, this the way I look at it, it, it smacks of uh, an, an attempt by a group of airlines to butt in into the proceeding to defend the Canadian Transportation Agency's uh, position and to uh, basically create a destruction. Uh, and, you know, when, when it comes to the Federal Court of Appeal, the attitude, the general judicial attitude is that Give me your case, explain me what the facts are, and be out. It's not a court where uh, any kind of lengthy bickering, lengthy uh, personal attacks on the other side would be welcome. It, in, in trial courts, you sometimes find uh, lawyers engaging in this kind of indefinite debates and letter writings. It doesn't fly that way in a trial court. They are, it's a very busy court. They are looking for errors. It's a court of error correction, not a trial court. And certainly it shows in, their, in the way they have approached this case and the way they approach it in general. Now, I'm sure you are uh, wondering uh, what happened with the CTA's response. So that will be exactly our next document to, to review together. The CTA filed a number of volumes of responses, and I'm going to uh, try to focus on uh, just their, their uh, factum. They also filed an affidavit, which also has some interesting tidbits to it. Um, but let's, let's look at the CTA's uh, materials. So, the volume two is just the Book of Authorities, so it's a bit less interesting, I guess, um, for the purpose of this uh, audience. Um, and so, it's just worth noting the length of the table of content and number of exhibits that they're putting forward. Um, this is actually a problem. So the last picture, I'm back here. Just the, the file itself has, has some issues. So let's see now. Um, and we are going to document. So, uh, 
I, Maria, by the way, I agree with you. The, the fact that NACC tried to intervene and the way they tried to intervene, it does show the level of uh, collusion and, and mutual uh, interest and mutual helping with, between the Canadian Transportation Agency and the airlines. And certainly I hope that this is not going to be lost on the court either. So uh, you're thinking in the right direction. So let's now look at what the Canadian Transportation Agency itself said. Uh, the the, the uh, way I'm looking at, at their submissions is a kind of scattered shot. They are, they are trying to talk about all sorts of things, except the things that are really in, important and interesting. Um, they, their, their essential argument uh, is that uh, because they concede right away that uh, the statement is not a binding decision. Let's start, let's start with that. The applicant's position with which the agency agrees is that this statement is not a binding decision and does not affect the rights of passengers or the obligation of airlines. So, of course, they are a bit slanting things here because just because it has no force of law, the reason that we are before the court, obviously, is because it is being treated by other players as if it were legally binding and that needs to be fixed, that appearance has to be fixed. Um, and they are saying here, oh, they are merely offering uh, suggestions in the context of an unprecedented situation, uh, and therefore judicial review is not available. So essentially, the Indian Transportation Agency is telling the court, stay out of it. This has nothing to do uh, with what courts normally do. Uh, judicial review is not available because it was just... Uh, a, a, a statement is not a decision, and uh, they are trying to uh, distance themselves now from it. And they, in, when, they, when they present a statement of facts, they put forward, uh, they, they talk about the agency's mandate, uh, and uh, uh, they, they uh, mention all sorts of things. And I'm, I'm going to skip many of things because we are now working on a response, reply to it, and I don't want to uh, to tip my uh, cards at this point, so I'm just going to give you some general sense of, of the CTA is going on and on about how uh, even in Europe some uh, countries uh, are committed to vouchers and uh, that the agency uh, was really concerned about those airlines. Um, the agency is also trying to include here reference to the uh, FAQs um, to try to explain um, that that they're claiming that they have been trying to clarify the situation there, and they that the FAQ confirm that the statement doesn't affect the passengers' oblig airlines' obligation or passenger rights, and that passengers are advised uh, if they believe they're not a refund, they may ask the airlines for a refund. So. They keep going on and on about that. Um, now, when you come to the statement of uh, submissions, uh, then they claim that a statement is a prudent expression of policy in extraordinary circumstances. Uh, and uh, they go on and on about, about what the statement is. They seem to be just rebeing themselves, actually. Uh, and... Uh, cite some irrelevant authorities, basically, and they uh, claim that they have made sure that it doesn't is not misinterpreted uh, because they put out this uh, statement on, on the FAQ. Um, they then go into some legal technicalities on on what is the legal test for an injunction, and they say that this is not met uh, that because we don't have a strong prima facie case. And they, I'm going to try to make sense of this for an average, uh, average uh, viewer. Um, it's not easy because it gets very technical, but they say that essentially that uh, the federal courts act, which uh, allows the federal court and federal court of appeal to 
uh, do judicial review does not include uh, the statement, that somehow the statement is not subject to judicial review. Essentially, they're telling the court that um, dealing with the statement that has been issued uh, is somehow outside the court's supervisory role. They're saying that's, that's beyond your powers. Don't go there. You don't have jurisdiction to, to interfere with that. And what the Canadian Transportation Agency is saying is that, that essentially uh, uh, you can only do judicial review of decisions or orders. Uh, and uh, they also acknowledge that there is a matter that could be there, but it includes not only uh, decision order, but merits respective remedy. So they, they kind of try to try to angle to the idea that because the statement is not an order, because it was not a decision, therefore really it's not something which is, you call it, justiciable, that the court cannot uh, rule on it. Like, for example, if the Canadian Transportation Agency put out a statement, the fact that they believe that the color blue is beautiful, the court would not go and conduct judicial review of that, uh, most likely because that's not a justiciable question whether the color blue is beautiful. They're trying to uh, angled the whole statement into something of that nature as if this, the statement the agency put out was of that type of just, you know, expressing some opinions, uh, non-binding. Um, and, of course, they, they are conflating the fact that it's legally not binding with the fact that, it, of course, it does create prejudice for the public. Um, they are trying to hide behind this sentence that any specific situation brought before the agency will be examined on its merits as a way of avoiding uh, the, the, the central issue here, which is that uh, we are dealing with a biased body, which there's a systemic uh, institution level bias. And they also claim that the rights of passengers are preserved. How interesting. Um, they are also referring to the to my statement in the press, that's paragraph 46. Uh, and they say, well, anyway, when members of the agency will be adjudicating disputes, they will not be bound by this statement. So, um, therefore, don't worry, we are still going to do justice. It, it's really not, you don't need to worry about this. Um, they, they say it's not about individual situations. It offer, contains only suggestions. It, it claim it cannot be enforced, not legally binding, and cannot be subject to the application of judicial review. That's, that's the part in which I think they are really getting to the wrong area. Uh, they claim here that it cannot be subject to an application of judicial review. Um, you know, generally, uh, when a statutory body like the agency is putting, doing anything uh, that falls within the core supervisory jurisdiction. So it's very interesting how uh, that is going to pan out. Generally, the courts don't like to see this kind of black holes of some areas where, where the um, court cannot reach. Uh, they also argue that there is no uh, prejudice uh, by the statement um, because it has no, no legal effect and uh, and they claim that uh, actually it even helps passengers. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. I, I'm having uh, difficulty not laughing at that. Um, and and the, um, Brian, you're quite right. The CT has not removed the initial statement. That's quite correct. Still there to mislead the public. Um, they also uh, go back to the idea that it is not a matter for which this review is available. And uh, they say that that uh, that it has to affect somehow the rights, but it, because it doesn't affect the rights, uh, therefore there is no case here. Uh, they go on to state that the application is without any merit. It's it's very standard type of of uh, lawyering, uh, nothing particularly uh, surprising, um, and and. Uh, um, and they say that because not binding, uh, passengers will have the full opportunity to make their case and those things will remain unaffected. Um, 
so and they are even going as far as saying this, this is quite amusing that even if air carriers or the members of the travel industry take a position that only vouchers are available when the flight is cancelled due to COVID pandemic, this does not affect the legal rights of passengers. It's an interesting uh, claim. Uh, and, and the next thing they are they are arguing, which I'm finding also typical uh, lawyer type of you know, a lawyer's way of saying in a very productive, productive way, I don't have a good defense, is to argue that the relief requested is not available, uh, which really gets into the uh, nonsense uh, criteria, because uh, they actually go as far as arguing that somehow the court uh, doesn't have jurisdiction to order the statement to be taken down, uh, which uh, I'm finding quite amusing. Because quite clearly, a federal court of appeal, which has uh, supervisory jurisdiction over the Canadian Transportation Agency, can pretty much tell them to do anything that the court finds just in the circumstances. So um, they, they, they go on to kind of pick apart each of the remedies that we sought uh, and um, to say that each of them, why it's not, the remedy is not available. Uh, and uh, they uh, they also argue that procedural fairness basically applies only if it is a decision, but uh, it is a state. They say it is a statement of policy only, and somehow in the agency's mind. Because it's only a policy statement, they can make any kind of policy statement and without impacting uh, their the, 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 their credibility and, and the public confidence in their ability to decide matters impartially. Um, the the uh, they they're also going on to argue that. Uh, that and this is quite remarkable. Again, here the policy statements of the agency are not subject to the rules of procedural fairness as dispute resolutions would be. And then they go on to explain that, that again the code of conduct uh, uh, I mean they acknowledge that the code of conduct requires members not to publicly express opinions on cases. Uh, but then they go on to say that this is not a public statement made by a member about any case and therefore the code of conduct does not apply. That's So essentially they are saying that uh, notwithstanding their own code of conduct, which explicitly prohibits uh, making public comments about not only current, but also, let's, let's highlight that, also about potential cases, uh, this statement is somehow exempt from that. Uh, it's it's a very you know it it seems that my first reaction about this was that yeah you may have heard of uh, those uh, people who who follow some pseudo legal theories so you can um, Google uh, Freeman on the land. And Freeman on the land somehow use believe that they are two separate legal entities, and somehow contracts made by one of the legal entities doesn't bind the other. What I'm reading here, the level of nonsense, reminds me of that to a great extent. That type of of, uh, of Freeman on the land type of of uh, argument, um, and they go on and on, uh, and they acknowledge here. That procedural fairness requires decision maker, which is uh, free of bias, and the procedural fairness doesn't apply to the agency as relating regulator issuing policy statements, uh, and um, they suggest that somehow in each individual dispute, passenger should be raising the same the issue of bias. Very very interesting. They they uh, they go on and uh, claim that there is no base in law for uh, stopping a quasi-judicial tribunal from precluding it from exercising its jurisdiction. 
uh, very, very uh, amusing. Um, and then they, they go on to explain about the remedy that we are seeking. And they say that, uh, uh, that they claim that, that that remedy of taking it down, of actually informing the public that the statement was incorrect, uh, um, must uh, cannot be granted because uh, it is available only if there is a public duty uh, that they have to perform, um, and there is no public duty apparently to provide correct information to the public if we accept the agency's arguments. Um, now, Brian Richmond is saying the CTA is accepting complaints, but it is not functioning. It is not dealing with any complaints due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It is not a valid reason to not review the complaints now. The complaints don't require a meeting face-to-face. -face. Well, Brian, I very much agree with you, but frankly, uh, I would add that I'm quite happy that the Canadian Transportation Agency is not operating because I don't think that after issuing the statement, they should in any way be involved in adjudicating disputes as relates to refunds. They have shown lack of impartiality. They are not able to run uh, the case in an independent, unbiased manner, in my opinion. And that's the reason that we think that they should ha not have anything to do with, the, with this case. So they go on and argue that, uh, that um, this, this should just go forward and um, justice better serve when tribunal is allowed to complete its work. And appeals can be heard on a basis that all contested issues are reviewed. Uh, basically, according to the agency's theory, uh, all thousands of people who are affected um, by, by the agency's biased behavior should then bring an appeal to the Federal Court of Appeal and then deal with the issue. Um, the, the, the agency is also making some interesting claims here. There is no legal authority for the assertion that they can permanently be disqualified their authority in particular types of cases. Um, I'm not going to say more on this now. We'll talk about it next week. Um, and then they go on uh, that agencies of the view there is no irreparable harm. Obviously, uh, all of you who, who are owed refunds, uh, you have no irreparable harm. They, they think that you should simply... Uh, there's nothing to prevent the agency or the court from proper jurisdiction to determine that the, air, the passenger is entitled to a refund, and there's no harm will result if the injunction is not granted. It's difficult to imagine what purpose it would serve. So they say, well, first of all, we don't have to be uh, biased. Uh, we don't have to be un unbiased. We don't, to, we don't have to be impartial when we make policy statements in any way. Uh, you can, you can appeal if you, our ruling if you don't like what we are ruling. So um, they also go into the uh, public interest consideration a little bit. Um, rights of passengers, which they claim to represent, um, and that it would be so bad for passengers if this biased body cannot possibly deal with uh, complaints. So they say that the motion should be dismissed, and then they are even saying that the application should be dismissed, which is a, per which is a particularly amusing uh, argument because they didn't ever brought any motion so uh, they, they are they are trying to have the whole case shut out even though they didn't bring a motion and they ask for an order dismissing the motion and application and basically they want us to be sent home what adds an additional interesting tidbit to this story is that uh, they submitted a uh, a um, affidavit by one of, by one of their uh, paralegals, and uh, once that affidavit was submitted, we served them uh, with a direction to attend. So normally, I mean, I'm sure you have seen it in movies, and and I mean, the, the movies are based on some of the reality that once um, someone provides an affidavit, you have the right to cross-examine that person on what they said. So we should uh, an, an affidavit. affidavit um, direction to attend to the affiant. So here we go. Um, this was uh, Meredith uh, Desnoyer. Um, and we asked uh, her to bring various documents to the cross-examination, some website statistics on how, how often um, the, the, the statement on vouchers was accessed. 
copies of all internal correspondence about the in the voucher. And we also asked for any correspondence with government players, with the transport minister, uh, clerk of the Privy Council, the Prime Minister, and any of their designates. Um, so, um, in if if the list here reminds you of something, I'm wondering who is who is who can first uh, blurt out. You know, just just give it some thought. When we look at this list, we look at the minister, the pre clerk of the privy council, the prime minister, and their designates. Does it remind you of something? A case recently that was in the media. Well, if if it's not obvious, then I will give it to you as homework. Just just give some thought. What these people are involved, and in, and you know, another story where where um, these people. Some of these people uh, were involved in, in questionable acts. So um, have, have a look at that. Um, what happened then is that, of course, we showed up for uh, the cross-examination as required, but uh, our friends from the Canadian Transportation Agency were no-shows. They previously sent a letter to the court saying that they basically refused to show up. And uh, so we obtained a nice, uh, yes, exactly, Daniel, very, you, you got it, SNC Lavalin. That's, that's, uh, uh, that, that, that has certainly been an inspiring case. Um, so and we obtained a nice certificate of non-attendance non signed by the court reporter and, uh, and we already filed it in court. Uh, so uh, this is so far the update that we have on the Federal Court of Appeal case. We are working uh, quite intensively on uh, the um, reply to the Canadian Transportation Agency submissions. I am not going to say anything about that. Once that reply is out, of course, it will be posted online as everything else at docs.airpassengerize.ca. Uh, where we have a big archive of all sorts of documents if you have time and you suffer from insomnia, you are certainly welcome to uh, have a look at that. Uh, and so um, once once we have that, I will be able to say more. I just don't think it's the right thing to, to uh, right now to uh, go into much of a chit chat about what uh, may be in our reply, what will not be in reply, what our point is. Uh, let's keep the suspense and let's let's wait until next week with that. Um, so uh, I think our next uh, uh, point. I just want to mention that I I don't have any specific update on the uh, class actions. Once we have some updates, of course, you will be the first to know. Um, but what I do have a number of updates on is the credit card. Uh, state uh, credit card chargeback issues. We managed to put our hands on more documents. One is a, a revised guide from uh, Visa. The other is from a uh, Mastercard. We managed to find something. Um, it's uh, almost a year old, but now at least we have something from Amex. So we are making progress there. It's not a. It's an ongoing effort, and I'm very very grateful for all of those who uh, privately sending me various links and information of where I can find those documents. Helpful. Um, yes, Wendy, that's, that's Wendy, you're on the right track there, exactly. Um, so um, I would like to, to first go to the visa statement. Just give me a moment to pull it up. Uh, one, one, thing, one difficulty is with working, um, you know, having, ha managing the, the uh, studio, so to speak, and at, and at the same time um, speaking is that I don't have the luxury of someone pulling up documents for me as uh, when, when, when I'm working this way. So let's just go back here to um, Visa document and, and go through it kind of, well, I'm not searching line by line, but, but with, a, with a fine, uh, fine uh, tooth comb, 
Um, it's, a, it's an interesting document because it emphasizes some things that are quite helpful for us. So let's just remember that this is uh, from the 23rd of April 2020. This is as recent as it can get. Uh, there is some overview which I don't particularly care about right now. Um, what I'm finding extremely helpful, and I'm very grateful uh, to um, Visa for this, uh, is that um, the I'm going to highlight it. The acquirer acquirer has the burden of proof to determine. Actually, it should be dem demonstrate if something qualifies as government prohibition must provide evidence of the law or regulation must explicitly prohibit the merchant from offering this. The word is explicitly. So the prohibition, for example, with respect to, uh, to um, someone says no voice. Did you lose my voice? Um, I'm just wondering if, if someone else also uh, lost my voice, lost voice, and let me know. But if my team can confirm, you can still hear me, then it'd be good. So the the uh, visa pol visas guidelines require uh, the the um, evidence by the merchant and explicit evidence to show that uh, the uh, government regulation, law, prohibition, prevented them from offering the service. It's not enough to them to say that they advised us, they suggested us. So um, here's an example, and, I, and again, it's a very, very thoughtful document. I'm not sure if I agree with it fully. In, I think it's a bit, does things still too narrowly, but at least it's clear. Uh, if the border is closed and the government expressly prohibits an airline from flying into the country, that would be an example of a situation where uh, Visa would recognize it as a, a government restriction. So, um, the, in, in, a, in a case where, where uh, uh, say they uh, they uh, tell airlines that they are not allowed to uh, bring in passengers. Including residents and nationals. And the only flights are allowed are cargo flights. Well, in such a situation, um, they would accept that uh, this would be a government, a government um, restriction. Or they give an example also with respect to gym membership, which you less care about. Uh, they also provide some very helpful guidance here on what will not be considered a valid, valid uh, government prohibition. So, a situation where business is still open without violating the law, but makes a business decision to close. And the first example, the very first example, is advisory regarding risk of traveling to a specific destination. Recommendations against gathering of certain sites. Guidance or best practice by government agencies or industry groups. Non-essential public event advisory or voluntary closure. Max mandated number of people to gather together. Restrictions impacting the merchants, passengers, or other consumers from showing up to receive the services. So all this are examples of situations that Visa will not recognize uh, as, a, as due to government restrictions. Maria is asking, what if they canceled prior to that border closing? I would say that if they closed prior, if they canceled prior to the border closing, then that means that they canceled due to uh, business considerations. So I would not worry about that. There's something specific about Brazil, these good guys, we don't need to go through that. Debbie is asking if the credit card companies are aware of the deceit from airlines and vacation companies, and they are not. Are they why are they allowing them to dispute the CC holder? Well, Debbie, to answer your question, um, the credit card has to allow the the airline to dispute the charges, but then has to allow passengers to uh, to rebut that. 
uh, so uh, it's 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 part of a you know it's part of a uh, in, impartiality. Uh, even at the best of times, their job is not to take sides here. Their their job is to simply um, tell both sides what their rights are and play by the by the game by the play the game by the rules. So um, the fact that 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 they allow the airlines to also um, dispute uh, the chargebacks, I don't see anything untoward about it per se. If they misinform passengers, if they tell passengers, say, well, I think you're going to lose anyway, it's not, not worth your time, that will be problematic because that's, that's already taking sides. As long as they are simply facilitating the, the dispute resolution, that's fine. And keep re I mean, bear in mind, just because your dispute has been uh, um, reversed in the first round, it doesn't mean that it stays that way. You still have the right to go back and uh, and rebut whatever the airline said, and then they have to. It's called in Mastercard case second presentment. In the case of Visa, it's called pre-arbitration for some reason. But it's the same situation where you put in a dispute. The airline says no, no, this is a valid charge, and then you put back a rebuttal and say no, actually this is not a valid charge. So it's very. It can be nerve wracking for you as a as a as a consumer, but I would not view it as something extraordinary it's just businesses and business usually another day in the office i also would like to show you uh the mastercard document that we managed to uh, obtain and this was a bit more painful to obtain i have not posted this document yet so this is going to be new but uh i would hope that uh someone from my uh loyal uh team will be uh, reminding me to post this April 6th document. Uh, there's a question here. How long do the companies have to dispute the chargeback request? That depends on the actual credit card company. It can range from 45 days to 100 days, depending on what the uh, credit card rules say, actually. So now we are looking at a MasterCard document. This is from April 6, 2020. And... Um, Let's just look at the most important points. They have here uh, stuff about best dispute practice hand handling, uh, chargeback FAQs. I would suggest that you read carefully if you cancel this section on cardholders canceling services, but we don't need to worry about it in today's uh, show. Uh, what I'm going to focus on today is the aspect of merchant cancellations. So we have seen these questions before. This question before that um, you, as a card holder, prepaid for services, say flights or uh, auto reservation. You were notified that a merchant will not be able to provide the services, and no refund has been processed. Do you have a right to dispute? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. There is a chargeback right when services are not provided, including when they are cancelled by a merchant due to government restrictions, insolvency, or other exceptional circumstances. So actually, MasterCard here says, even if it is cancelled due to government restrictions, you have a right to a chargeback, and unless, let's make it clear, unless, Let's break it down. So unless the first possibility is the merchant has a right to provide the cardholder with reasonable alternatives based on the terms and conditions properly disclosed to the cardholder at the time of purchase, not any time. The, it has to be disclosed, those terms and conditions, at the time of purchase, or based on applicable government legislation or regulation. So basically, the merchant has to have, um, and, it, and it explains here very, very beautifully, there may be no charge of if the merchant is required by the government to impose a voucher or other reasonable alternative in lieu of a ref, for refund. So if there is 
an actual uh, government requirement to provide vouchers and provider to provide vouchers instead of a refund, that would affect your charge rec rights. Um, I'm getting here some questions. These documents are online. Uh, for MasterCard, I'm going to post this document online very shortly. Uh, and Helen, yes, you should be reading through it thoroughly. Uh, if you go uh, under units in the group, uh, then you will find most of those documents there, except for this MasterCard, which I haven't uploaded yet, uh, but will be uploaded there. Uh, Dominic is doing an amazing job also providing the links. But if you go under units, under unit one, you will see uh, that uh, you will see most of those documents. And Michelle is asking whether you have been successful getting a refund. Many people, Michelle, have been successful at getting refunds. Uh, and, and so I've seen a number of cases that have already been closed and determined. But the battle is still ongoing. Don't expect it to be easy. That's, I think, the most important thing to take away from it. Let's go on. Uh, the cardholder is notified that the date of service concert flight was changed due to restrictions. However, the cardholder cannot or doesn't want to use the services on the new date. Does an issuer have a chargeback right? And the answer is yes. When those services are postponed and not accessible by a cardholder, you do have a right to charge back. You don't have an obligation to accept reasonable alternatives unless required by the terms and conditions properly disclosed to the cardholder at the time of the purchase or applicable government legislation or regulations. So, they cannot go back in time. I mean, after all, we're not in uh, uh, the movie Back to the Future. They cannot go back in time and impose some kind of conditions on you that weren't in your terms and conditions when you purchased the ticket. Uh, there is also an interesting tidbit here, which I suggest that you read. This is about what happens when the flights were cancelled, but other services are still available. Uh, I haven't seen this happen as much of a problem, but check it out. Um, now we also have some stuff about the force majeure clauses. And I think that, that this is also a reasonable statement that uh, they, there's no clear answer in that case uh, from MasterCard's perspective. I think that's a fair statement from their perspective because it's a complex question. So uh, in that case, MasterCard will, is going to uh, review the situation and ultimately uh, determine the case on the case-by-case -case basis. This is important because if anybody is trying to tell you on the phone, hey, we are not going to take your dispute because there is a, there is a, a, a force majeure clause, then here's the response. The response, immediate response is, well, actually, you do have to look at it. Ultimately, what is, you may reach some conclusion, uh, but you certainly have to uh, have a look at it. You cannot just uh, turn, turn it away. And with respect to force majeure, we have to bear in mind that those clauses are also subject to the Provincial Consumer Protection Acts. And you cannot have a contract where you basically agree to take the money and there will be no consequence for you if you don't deliver. You don't even have to bring money. Um, there is more stuff here on reasonable alternatives for uh, services can canceled by the merchant. Uh, it confirms that the merchant can offer passengers vouchers, but passengers can insist on getting cash. It repeats the, the, the thing that we discussed before, that reasonable alternatives for future services cannot be imposed on the cardholder in lieu of a refund unless it's somehow in the contract. Uh, again, with respect to three, they, they are now recognizing that they have to look at the legislation. Uh, and 
and I think I think this is the probably the, the what you want to cite to anybody that you cannot pre-confirm stuff before it, uh, the uh, case goes to arbitration, because there are issues with the EU saying one thing, but some states, unfortunately, in the European Union, saying something else. Uh, we will also be overcoming that soon, I hope. Uh, but I think it's also a fair statement by MasterCard. I, I see nothing untoward about it. Um, also, if you accept vouchers, but then they go uh, bankrupt, you will have a right uh, for a uh, chargeback. And um, one thing that MasterCard makes, and I think it's it's also a fair statement, is that... Uh, if you if you accepted uh, vouchers, they canceled services, they offered vouchers, and then you changed your mind. Can you later on go back and say, "Well, actually, I want my my refund"? The answer is no. So if you have reached an amicable uh, solution, you accepted it, then you cannot go to a refund afterwards, um, if even if it was orig originally refundable. Um, although you may still have a right to a chargeback on the basis of uh, the alternative services cannot be used as described. Um, they also mention here this aspect of second presentment of documents. So um, the main thing here, which if it ever comes up, is that there has to be evidence that it was really accepted by the cardholder. Um, and I would say that with the vast amount of misinformation going out there, I don't think that this, they, they have a good case unless you really freely accepted it. Now, Ray is asking, uh, Ray Gagnon is asking about Visa debit. I'm not an expert on, on uh, debit cards. I, I don't even use them much myself. Uh, I do believe that their Visa debit also has a kind of chargeback procedure. And I suspect, although I don't know, that a Visa chargeback procedures would be similar to the uh, Visa credit card procedure. Um, Christy is asking, can the government ruling enable vouchers be enacted after the fact? Um, Krista, I don't think that you can have much of a retroactive legislation. Um, it would be very, very challenging from a legal perspective. There is a strong presumption against such kind of, of you know, legislation that goes back in time because you want to have uh, clarity. You want to have, um, you want to have a clear situation and... Um, and, and I, I would be very surprised if it happened. Um, th there are some other questions here. One more thing I would like to draw your attention to, uh, which is that if you book the flight by an online travel agent, and the online travel agent is telling you that they are only responsible for making the reservation but not the flight, do you have a chargeback right? And the answer is yes. MasterCard would view the online travel agent as the merchant and agent of the travel su supplied, regardless of the terms and conditions disclosed to the cardholder. Let me go back to it. This is very important. Regardless, regardless of the terms and conditions. So if they try to give you some kind of nonsense about, oh, well, you know, we just sold you the ticket, but we, it's not our fault, then at least as far as MasterCard is concerned, here's your answer. And this would be a perfect answer in cases like uh, Flight Hub, like Expedia in some cases, Flight uh, uh, Center, and so on. Even if they charge your card, uh, you still can pursue them under a chargeback. Um, and just to confirm again, these documents uh, are available, and this one will be made available shortly, after under uh, the units so i would suggest that you all uh, confirm that you know where units are in this group for you, you it may look differently on a desktop than a laptop 
uh, and uh, we will be updating information there regularly as information comes in. Uh, and I'm uh, wondering now, just uh, we have had a very high uh, attendance for this uh, video, more than 200 people at sometimes, uh, but I'm not seeing now any more questions. So either uh, you're speechless or either you did a very good job at explaining things or you have already fallen asleep because the legalese can really put you to sleep. Uh, I'm not sure uh, which of the case. I'm wondering also, it's a question for my wonderful team, uh, whether any questions, are there any questions that I uh, missed? So um, I'm, I'm wondering if there is any, anything else I should still address. Um, Zach, you did miss the, uh, the visa portion. Uh, we did discuss visa. Um, if you accept a voucher, the question is, visa has an ambiguous language there. So some language there, they say that actually you can still seek a chargeback. Um, I would generally uh, focus on the aspect that um, whether you freely accept something. If you have accepted it knowing that you have a right to a, to a chargeback, you have a right to a refund, sorry, uh, then you're probably not in a good situation. If you accepted it uh, by deceit, that's a separate story. Generally, acceptance by deceit is, does not uh, negate any right that you have. That's, you know, if, if someone defraud you to accept something, it doesn't mean that you genuinely out of your free will accepted it. There's a question also from uh, Melissa, what about tour operator who booked the flight for you uh, and she asked for the cancellation of her tour, can she do a chargeback of anything? Um, if you ask for, to cancel your tour, there is a question of whether the tour was refundable. And with respect to the tour, Melissa, the, the question is, um, did you cancel or did they cancel? Did you authorize the cancellation of your flights as well or only of your other services? You need to look at the facts. Generally, if a tour operator goes ahead and cancels a service on your behalf without your consent, that's certainly a base for a chargeback. You never authorize them to do something for you. Uh, it's like uh, someone using your credit card for their own personal expense. Just because you give your credit card number to the travel agency doesn't mean that they can do anything with you want. They cannot buy box of pizza with it for themselves, for heaven's sake. So if they didn't have your consent to canceling your flight, surely you can charge. Um, Brian is asking, what uh, would the meaning of freely be? Well, that's ob obviously a very touchy question, Brian. Uh, I would say you would have to uh, simply say that you didn't know your rights. It wasn't part of the terms and conditions. And the merchant airline would be hard pressed to demonstrate that they told you, they inform you that you have the right to a refund. And uh, nevertheless, you chose to accept vouchers. There is also a question that would come up in such situation is the question of consideration. Normally, if you accept something that is less valuable than something else, there has to be additional consideration. So for example, if you have a voucher for 125% of the original value, there's your consideration. If there is no consideration, then I would say that it is more likely that you were deceived than that you voluntarily agreed to forego your refund. Uh, Ryan was asking, uh, Ryan Lee, uh, with respect to Q5, I hope the original refund option was a future credit with no possibility of a cash refund. Uh, then a customer should be able to charge back after initially accepted the credit. I'm not sure if I understand Ryan Lee's question. I'm happy to discuss it after, afterwards. Um, Maria is asking here, I'm confused. I thought I understood that if I bought the tickets through Expedia, I should go directly to the airline. Is this correct? So Maria, the situation that this uh, guy was referring to the situation when it was Expedia that charged your credit card. So whenever you deal with chargebacks, the first thing to do is check your credit card statement, who charged your card and go to that party. If in some cases it is a travel agent that charge your card, then you can go to them. In any event, I would also go to the airline, just as a matter of, of double checking, having all your I's dotted and T's crossed. But this referred to a situation where 
the online travel agent put the charge on your card. For example, Flight Hub may do it. You will see on your credit card statement the charges by Flight Hub. Um, oh, thank you. Dominic is telling me, and I do apologize for my oversight. I covered two of the two things, uh, which is uh, Visa, and, Visa and MasterCard, but I neglected to cover uh, Amex, so American Express. And I, uh, well, this is, this is why I so much enjoy having a team uh, assist me because that way I don't make such goof ups. So let me pull that up. It's a somewhat um, dated document, it's from last year, but as it happens with such things, it's the best thing that we have right now. Uh, so we will use it until we manage to get uh, another document. Um, and just to un answer Helen's question, absolutely do not accept vouchers when you speak to airlines. That's a very clear, good statement. Make it cl abundantly clear in all your stay communications that you do not, by any stretch, accept vouchers. Make it like a mantra. I do not accept it. I do not accept it. Every communication you make it clear, I do not accept it. Um, now let's go to, to uh, this uh, American Express um, guy. This is, as I mentioned, it is something from, uh, it is something from uh, 2019. So um, it's not fresh, but it is the best that we have. And what we found so far here is on page 40, the good services not uh, received, it provides a good idea of what is expected in such situations. So here's a chargeback guide, chargeback code C08, good services not received. This is more for merchants, from a merchant's perspective, uh, but it can provide a good insight as to uh, what is uh, expected in such situations. So for what I found particularly helpful is the guide here to what uh, Amex reasonably expects the airline to provide. So evidence that the, you participate in the flight, um, the, the uh, for example, if credits were given for, uh, for uh, flight uh, miles, that could be an interesting thing, uh, proof the flight in question was available if the airline is in bankruptcy and any additional transactions related to original transactions such as seat upgrades, baggage, purchase made on board. But basically they say that if you claim you didn't get the uh, services you were owed and here's another transaction of that you bought a, a sandwich on board, then probably you were actually on board and you were, you were just making it up. Um, that's, re that's really the... the um, essence of this. It's not as detailed as I wish it were, but it is something uh, um, to work with. I, I don't think Amex is the best card. I think Amex is giving now a lot of trouble um, to, um, to people and I'm not happy with Amex. I'm not impressed with them. So uh, they, are, they, are, they are right now a bit on my, on my naughty list. And, and, and getting on my not list is not a good idea. So I, I'm, I would like, I, I have some concerns about how they have been handling some of the cases. Deborah Elizabeth is asking, my flight mysteriously disappeared on the WestJet site. When I phoned, they told me it was canceled. My US travel agent never called me to inform me of such. Both parties told me I would only be able to accept a voucher. I did not accept. So tomorrow I will be going into chargeback with MasterCard against a travel agency, correct? So I involve the DOT. Deborah Elizabeth, very good question and thank you for this question. So first of all, complaining to the Department of Transport is always a good idea. Uh, they need to have the data, the data points that those airlines are misbehaving. Tomorrow calling your credit card company is also a great idea. I hope that you already followed our guides and recorded your calls with the airline or with the travel agency, whoever told you that your flight is no longer operating, you have something in hand. In addition, you may also want to use FlightAware 
as a way of obtaining further proof that flights with the number that they claim that you are supposed to be on did not exist on the day. So that's another good uh, resource. FlightAware allows you to look up to 90 days back of uh, flight history if, if you create a free account. It's a free subscription or free account that you can create. Um, I'm seeing here from a question from Joseph. Let me just see that. Uh, so Joseph Smith is asking, just want to confirm on the 16th of Sunwing canceled southbound flights, thus affecting my vacation. I was on that initiated the I was one to initiate the cancellation request though after a Sunwing announcement. Still considered them canceling though. Joseph, your situation is tricky. I would say that um, the first question is what was the date of your travel? Uh, Sunwing voluntarily agreed to provide refunds to people whose travel was between the 17th of March and the 9th of April. So that puts you in a very easy situation there. They agreed to something. Um, beyond that, I would also look at who canceled first, really, whether your cancellation was processed, received by them. I would still try a charge back because it's a kind of borderline situation. They made this blanket cancellation of all their flights. I don't think they should be able to keep money but the credit card company may think otherwise it's it's a borderline case it's it's a close call i would say morally and in terms of the law in terms of what will happen in a class action there's no doubt that you will be getting back your money uh, that's my anticipation but with respect to chargebacks uh, chargeback is not the same as a court proceeding they have to look different criteria they are not adjudicating uh, disputes like a court would do uh, Samir is saying EK was agreed to refund, but saying it wait 90 days. Uh, can someone help me what EK means? It's a, which airline is EK? Um, I, I, it escapes my mind. Is it Etihad or, or, uh, something else? In any event, if an airline promises you a refund, I hope that you have something in writing to confirm that. So if you have a email or if not have an email and recording of that that would be great and necessary but i wouldn't wait more than 15 days if you want to be super nice maybe 15 business days after that call your credit card company and say hey the merchant agreed and promised a refund but i'm not getting the refund so please process it as a chargeback um thank you Dominique. emirates thank you uh christine is also asking here christine melville I lost chargebacks with MasterCard and filled in their forms returned to them a week ago. No amount by MasterCard has been paid into my account. Is it normal um, or should they uh, put the money back into my account immediately if they accept my chargeback? Christine, it depends very much on the credit card company you have. Many of them will issue you a temporary credit and uh, they should, but it may take them time to process your request. If you're super concerned, give it another week and uh, maybe next week uh, or the week after next week and give them a call and say, hey, did you receive my documents? What is happening with my temporary credit? That's the official. Um, Melissa is asking, what is a reasonable length of time to wait for a refund? In the European Union, it says seven days. Uh, I would wait 15, just as a good measure. After 15 days, initiate a chargeback. Worst case scenario, they are processing the, the refund in the meantime, and then the credit card company will see that uh, they are issuing you a refund anyway, so there will be no harm. If for whatever reason you would be receiving both a refund and a chargeback, you of course have to notify the credit card company that there is an error. You cannot and should never double dip. That's not right. It's legally and morally both wrong. Uh, but uh, other than that concern, uh, I would say after 15 days that they promise you a refund, I would not wait for six weeks, absolutely not, because then there can be some issues of why you haven't charged back earlier. Just go ahead with the charge. Um, Lenore is asking here uh, about uh, travel agents, uh, Air Canada telling travel agents to discourage clients from issuing charge because travel agents will be responsible if charge succeeds. Lenore, these are simple lies that have been spreading around uh, by airlines, by travel industry players. The truth is, 
the travel agent is not on the hook for chargebacks for non-performance. If there is a fraudulent transaction, they would be on a chargeback. If they accept the card without proper signature, without properly verifying that a cardholder is the person whom they claim to be, then they would be on the hook for a, for a chargeback. But they are not on the chargeback for services not received. There is not a single document that would suggest that. These are simple lies or misinformation that uh, people who have financial interest in refusing or frustrating those refunds are putting out there to harness the fear, the concern, uh, the sympathy uh, toward travel agents uh, and, and, and effectively uh, jeopardize the right of passengers, undermine the rights of passengers for a refund. So it has no basis to my knowledge. Um, Tony, there are no success rate statistics at this point because small claims courts have not been processing anything. Uh, here in Halifax, we have hearings for some issues that are still from January or February, scheduled for June. And those COVID-19 cases have not reached at any kind of hearing before a small claim course. So don't expect statistics. Um, Christina is asking, uh, you have a trip in July to Greece. When should we be in process of canceling the trip? So the general wisdom remains, if you have a trip in July, do not cancel now. Just give it some time. Uh, just wait things out. There is no urgency here. There is no reason to rush. Just to wait things out maybe a week or a few days before your flight and uh, if the flight is still operating then you can be concerned but right now for something in July we don't know what will happen. Will it be a case of, of you know perhaps a second or third wave of COVID or maybe they found a miracle, miracle cure for it? Fortunately I doubt it but we cannot know what's happening. Um, Samir is asking, is there a chargeback option for partially used ticket? Absolutely yes. So if you use a part of the ticket but your re return ticket uh, is cancelled, it's not operating, then of course you can do a chargeback on that. Absolutely yes. Um, question by Lian. Tickets to Ottawa purchased on Hopper flying June 9th with Porter Airlines. Porter has cancelled flying to Ottawa until end of June. Do we uh, do we get to hop her for credit card refund instead of accepting vouchers for one year traveling? So I would make it clear both to Hopper and to Porter that you insist on your right to a refund. In the case of Porter, there is even an explicit precedent that they are required to provide the refunds. That's from the Canadian Transportation Agency before they uh, became uh, very, very cozy with the airlines uh, from 2013 and 14. So uh, if they refuse to pay, just issue a chargeback. No, no question there. Um, more questions here. Uh, flight was canceled, booked through Expedia. WestJet for May 31st from New Brunswick to New York. Uh, what should my steps be? Well, Chris, if it is something in the end of May, I would perhaps wait a few more weeks. Uh, you would ideally want to have a clear document showing in your hand that a flight was canceled. That's the best position where you want to be. That's where I would want to be in this kind of um, Melissa is asking, if we lose chargebacks, can we start a new one? Well, if the first chargeback comes back as a decline, you can still escalate it further for a second presentment. And uh, if they still refuse it, then you can sue the credit card company and the airline. And I would probably do it if there are bases for the chargeback. The credit card company should not be able to get away with this. Kind of so if they want to bankroll their airlines and they want to pay for them, they will be our guests. Uh, Kathy is asking, my airline wants me to accept their changed flight after they cancel and have provided new flights the day before. What if I don't? Kathy, as we have seen in the MasterCard guy, you don't have to accept. It's an offer. I mean, if, if think about it. If, if, uh, if somebody asks you out for a coffee, do you have to accept it? No, there's no difference here. It's your money, your life, your decision. They offered it, you decline. You tell them if you decline and they have to issue you a refund. MasterCard made it very clear that they cannot just impose things on you. 
Scott Greenwood is asking, I contact the credit card company about an update on my chargeback just to be see if anything actually been done. It has been three weeks and they say it could take 45 to 60 days. Unfortunately, things are taking a long time. In some provinces, there are statutes that require the credit cards to process those things in a timely manner within X number of uh, days or billing cycles. You may want to look those things up. There is a post uh, pinned to the top of the announcements, which has linked to provincial legislation. Um, so I see a question by Nancy. Uh, I'm just wondering if I booked with Sunwing for departure March 14th. The trip wasn't canceled, but I was not feeling safe. Well, for a March 14th trip, if you canceled, then likely your remedies would be either frustration of contract in small claims courts or the class action. Uh, in a situation where you cancel and the flight was still operating, there is no easy way of, of getting back your money other than small claims courts or a class action. I'm um, Anna is asking here, and I have to also tell my, my team to a little bit slow down because I cannot answer all the questions this quickly. Uh, Air Canada cancelled my flights for mid-May. I was not notified by travel agent. I had to contact the agency. My travel agent says I can get a refund minus $250, $15 penalty. No, 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 no. Anna, if the airline cancelled your ticket, you don't have to cancel yourself. It is them cancelling, not you. Keep it that way. They want always to make things look as if you were cancelling. In your case, it's very simple. They cancel your flight, you decline to accept other alternatives, and they have to issue you a refund. End of story. Uh, Alex uh, uh, is asking uh, here, uh, my wife's flight to ICN with Air Canada has changed multiple times back and forth, more than 12 hours departure arrival for his upcoming May. It's upcoming May. They keep rescheduling it. I was wondering if it's enough for us to claim a refund contact Air Canada. So Alex, to answer your question, we need, I think we need to discuss it in a particular thread to see all the changes they made. Uh, I will be looking at the following things. First, was there an actual change to the flight number? If a flight number changes, it's a flight cancellation. Like if the flight with the original number doesn't operate, the flight was canceled. Another thing to note is that if the times have changed, they delayed by three hours, it's also entitling you to, to uh, um, cancel the flight in many cases. We just have to carefully look at the language there. But if the flight is canceled, that's a, that's a no-brainer. Then you can actually invoke Section 17 of the APPR. Uh, I'm looking here another question. Um, Renan, I'm stuck outside Canada in Brazil. Uh, Air Can Expedia refuses to follow APPI rebooking a new flight at no extra cost. Even Air Canada policy says that. There are still flights operating by Air Canada and partners covering this trip. I even have call recorded where a representative said she would do the booking, but when I called back, they refused. They want me to wait until June. Renan, this is very, very interesting. My instinct with respect to this kind of situation would be the following. If you have already a flight with those, Air, it's an Air Canada, right? So if you have a flight with Air Canada and they refuse to honor the obligation to rebook you, I would book another flight back and then charge back the second flight because they made you pay for a service that you have already paid for once. And if necessary, you get out in court for fraud, for non-performance, but I think it will be a form of fraud essentially trying to force you to pay twice for the same service, that's, that gets close to fraud at least. Uh, probably, certainly it's a case of, of uh, non-performance, but maybe you can even push it more. Uh, there is no reason why they should be charging you twice for the same service. You already paid for a flight back to Canada, so you shouldn't be paying for it a second time. I'm seeing here a question uh, by Karen. Uh, Sunwing canceled my March 17th when I completed the refund option for reimbursement the emails they sent me said I canceled, which I didn't. Just chose a refund to method of payment. Um, Karen, they are trying, as you can see, to create a false impression that you canceled. Uh, we have screenshots of those uh, um, forms, and we also have screenshots proof that 
something announced the cancellation. So I would simply note it if it comes to evidence that they gave you back a fraudulent email that fraudulently, falsely uh, claimed that you cancelled while the truth is that they cancelled. And verifying it is very easy because we all know there is a public announcement on the 17th of March that that's not being cancelled. And from Kim, when airlines cancel your flight, aren't they supposed to rebook you a new flight? This is what happened with WestJet. Cancelled all flights as of March 22nd, leaving everyone to get their own flights home. Uh, Kim, generally when the airline cancels a flight, of course they are supposed to rebook you, even if it is outside their control. That's section 18 of the APPR. There's no doubt about it. But what happens if no such flights are available? That's, I think, what the airlines will try to argue. Of course, if there are flights available and they're still not rebooking you, then they are obviously breaking their law. Gordon is asking, how soon do I chase Air Canada after they cancelled my flight from London Heathrow to Calgary on March 26th? They have had my money since June 2019. Olivia, I would have filed already a credit card dispute. Uh, March 26th was, as I understand, uh, more than a month ago. So go after them and, and, uh, and uh, file a chargeback right away. Cassandra is asking, my flight to Greece is bound uh, by, is bought, just trying to, sorry. Um, Cassandra is asking, my flight to Greece is bought by Air Canada, but part of my trip, Germany to Greece, is operated by Lufthansa. Air Canada told me I cannot use EU laws because the company is Air Canada, the European airline. So Cassandra, they are lying to you. They are lying to you as usual. The European Union's laws apply to any segment of your travel that departs from the European Union. If that segment is cancelled, they have to give you a refund of your ticket if you didn't depart yet. That would be section uh, 7 sub 3, which provides refunds in cash, and section uh, article 8 sub 1 sub A of the European Regulations 261 of 2004. I also uh, would like to do a bit of a check on the time. Uh, we have been doing it for 90 minutes. That's uh, quite a record, almost a record for our group. Uh, I'm not seeing many more questions, so um, I'm wondering if there is maybe one, one or two more questions I can answer, and then we should call it a day, if you, if you are all okay with that. Uh, I'm also seeing a drop in the uh, number of viewers, so uh, it may be a good time to finish but maybe we can squeeze in uh, one or two more questions, if there is one. Uh, team, would you like to suggest me two more last questions to answer? Um, I, I, I think I answered all those questions that have already been posted here to me through this feed. Um, so, uh, I see here a question, capture it. Okay, yes, that's a question by, by uh, Prakalp. I booked travel from Toronto to US for my parents in January, which was canceled by WestJet. When I called the World Elite MasterCard for uh, filing a charter dispute, the credit card agent is asking for proof of WestJet cancellation policy, which says that the airline will pay refund. Uh, WestJet's site has no such wording. What should I do? Uh, the answer to such thing is very simple. You do not have to provide such a policy. It's a very simple thing. They cancel your service. Therefore, under Massacre International's guidelines that we have just seen, you have a right to a chargeback. It is the merchant, it is WestJet that has to provide some kind of proof that they can just walk away without offering you a refund. They actually have to prove that at the time you made a purchase, that policy was in place. They may be hard pressed to do so. I don't think that, that, that they had such a policy which would, for example, call for vouchers. So I would not be too concerned about it. And part of this, the way to deal with such situations is to push back very hard. It's, it's to say, no, you're wrong. The utmost respect. I know my rights. Actually, uh, MasterCard International says so and so, and just look up your your own documents from April sixth. This is what the document is called, and uh, confirm confirm with your superiors. 
may also want to ask for supervisors if needed. Just don't take no for an answer. And make sure that in your whole tone, your whole demeanor, you convey that you are not asking them a favor. You are not there to negotiate. You are there to take what belongs to you. Um, I think that uh, this probably is a good time to stop. Uh, I see no more question on my screen here uh, that I need to answer, and we have been going for 90 minutes. So I would like to again thank for all of those who joined today's uh, live show, and I also especially want to thank the volunteers who have been helping in the background uh, the production which are, of course, Christine, Dominic, and Martin, and our volunteer, uh, Terry, who has now been moderating the group uh, for several weeks now. And they are making all this possible. So we are very, very grateful to them. Thank you for listening. And we will see each other again next weekend.